All right, who's ready for a miracle in your life today, man? Come on now, I can't hear you. Who's ready for a miracle? All right, there we go. We're in the middle of our series we are calling the Miracle Series. And today I can't wait to talk to you about how Jesus heals the blind. Now, this is an incredible story, but before we get started, how many like house transformation shows? Anybody like those house? How many get addicted to those house transformation shows? How many of you wish that Chip and Joanna would show up at your house one day, yeah? Some of you like, oh, yes, Chip, 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 Chip. He's married, ladies. Chip, show up to my house, and Joanna, show up, renovate my house. You know, I love, I love watching them, and I can tell you the truth, that I can never see what they see. I mean, they, they bring some of these houses on there, and they're like, oh, yeah, you can do this and this and this, and you can open these walls here, and we can raise this up here, and we can put the beams here, and we can add on here, and you're like, what are you seeing, you know? How, how do you see that? I don't see that. I, sometimes I just see junk. I just see a house that probably needs condemned. There's actually a house a few blocks from where we live that on my way to take the kids to school, I passed by it, and it looks like it's needed to be condemned for several years. Like no one's lived there. It's run down. It's a really small uh, shack, and it looked like it needed to be pushed over, condemned. Somebody bought that property, and they gutted out that house, and they made that small shack that needed to be condemned like to an entryway, and then they built on a two-story house right behind it. And I'm like... How'd you, how, why, how? I can't even see how they did that and how they're making this whole property come to life now. And they took something that needed to be condemned and they're making it into something very beautiful. And in our own life, this was the same way. It applies that many times we can't see past people's mess to see the masterpiece that God's got. You know, the Bible says that we are God's masterpiece. It says that we are chosen of him. And many translations actually translate when it talks about how God sees us. And you actually use that word, we are God's masterpiece. That means the most valuable of the creations. And so, but for many of us, we have a hard time seeing certain people and be like, all I can see is their mess. All I can see is how they're messed up. All I can see is how the junk in their life. And I pray that Jesus helps us see beyond the mess of people's lives and helps us see the wonderful masterpiece that he's wanting to do in their life. And not only in other people's lives, but in our life. Our life as well, that many times we can't see past the mess of our own life to see that God is wanting to do something miraculous in us, through us, for us, to us. He wants to take our mess and turn it into his masterpiece. But many times we can't see that or understand that. And so I'm hoping today that you begin to see yourself for the way God sees you. And you learn to see somebody else to some way. So look at somebody right now and tell them, there's more to me than the mess you see. There's more to me than the mess you see. Someone says about time, amen? Yeah. Let's go to our story here. I love the story in John chapter 9. We see three different times where Jesus healed a blind person, and this is one of those stories. I love this particular story, and we're going to use it today for our text. Let's start off in John 9, verses 1 and 2. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. And they said to him, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, when we read that, first of all, it seems like, what a dumb, for you and I, it's kind of like a dumb question, you know? It doesn't make a lot of sense for us to compute that and think about why they would ask that question. But realizing during this day, it was a very solid belief that if somebody was born with an ailment or had a handicap, it was because God was punishing them, either something they did personally or something their parents had done or somebody in their, their lineage had committed this great sin. And this is God's way of punishing them. It was a common practice. That's the way they believed. So for them to ask this question, it wasn't that they were trying to be sarcastic. It wasn't that they were trying to you know, do anything that nobody else was already thinking. They're thinking, all right, they're discovering that, hey, Jesus... He really is the Son of God. 
So now he can answer this question that maybe we've been debating amongst ourselves. Because this has been a hot topic. We've been asking this question. Let's ask Jesus this question. And we see this happening here. But I would tell you, it's not, it's not too far-fetched from what we do today. Because they're like, who's to blame? Is he to blame or is his parents to blame? And if we really are not careful today, we know that a lot of people like to blame everybody else for the problems, right? Who's really to blame? And, well, if my parents hadn't done this, or if this person hadn't hurt me, or if this person had treated me better, or if this person hadn't abused me, or if this person... And I understand that those things do affect our life. I'm not here to downplay anything bad that's happened to our life. But at some point, as we grow and mature, we have to decide, I'm not going to live there. That I am more than that. And I can either be a victim all my life or I can learn to be victorious and grow stronger from my pain. And I'm stepping out of the person I used to be. I'm stepping out of the mess I used to be. And God's going to transform me into something strong. God's going to transform my hurt to somebody else's story and help somebody else. Uh, we got to quit blaming everybody else at some point and take responsibility and say, I'm moving out. I'm moving beyond. I'm going away from the place of my greatest hurt or my greatest failure. Stop blaming other people. Many people get stuck there. Jesus can see our mess and he can see us healed. See, he can see our mess, but he sees beyond our mess. He sees us healed. He sees us, he sees us walking whole. Now let's pick it up in verse 3. Verse 3 says, it was not, this is Jesus' answer to them, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. Jesus answered, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. See, they were trying to blame it on somebody, and Jesus said, you boys are not catching the real meaning today. It doesn't make a difference why this happened, but what I'm about to tell you is this, that today something miraculous is about to happen to this man, and what they didn't understand was even 2020, 2,000 years later, there was going to be somebody telling his story about how Jesus came through and miraculously healed this man. See, he sees beyond the mess. He sees beyond the junk in our life, and he sees us walking healed. And it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity. See, we got to get this point that our greatest weakness is God's opportunity to be at his strongest in our life. Because the scripture says when we are weak, he is strong. Correct. And so this is what Jesus was saying. Quit worrying about why this happened and realize there's an opportunity lying ahead of us. Look at this statement. Today, let's, let's stop seeing the mess and start seeing the opportunity for God to move. See, we should, if our eyes would be differently, if we would walk tomorrow differently than today, we would quit walking through places and see that person's life's a mess. That person's marriage is a mess. That person's finances are in a mess. That person's kids are in a mess. That person's health is in a mess. And instead, we will walk through and say, well, here's an opportunity for God to move. Here's an opportunity for God to heal. Here's an opportunity for God to encourage. Here's an opportunity for God to restore. Here's an opportunity for God to bring a marriage back together. It's a whole different way of thinking that Jesus was trying to get his disciples to understand, to really comprehend. It's really focused on the most important thing here. So how do we do this? Number one, we've got to realize God uses every normal means possible. That God uses many times to do the miraculous, that God will use everyday normal things that we don't see and identify we don't understand the miracle working power of God. Some things feel ordinary, and so we don't understand it. Let's read verses 4 and 5. This is what Jesus said. We must now quickly, let's say that word together, quickly, come on, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. He goes, but while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus was communicating to his disciples, 
hey, now is the time to act. Now, let's do it quickly. Let's be about the Father's business quickly. Let's pray quickly. Let's believe quickly. Let's give words of affirmation quickly. Well, I'm praying whether or not I should encourage this person at work. No, do it now. I'm praying whether I should pray for them. They're going through a hard time. No, do it now. Quickly, quickly be about it. Now is the time. If you think about it, you'll talk yourself out of it. Well, that's not really God. God can't really use my words. God couldn't really use my little weak prayer. And what we've got to realize is God is exactly what God wants to use. Because that's where he gets the most glory. That when we can begin to operate in faith, now, quickly, is the time. Quickly. Look at verse 6. It says that, this is what happened. Now, then Jesus, he spit on the ground. Yeah, if you didn't, you didn't read that wrong. It's spit. We can translate it. All, all, we can make it try to sound pretty. He spatteth upon the groundeth. <laughs> Saliva came flying out of his mouth and landed softly upon the ground. I don't, I, you can make it sound all you want, but let's just be honest. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus spit, okay? And it wasn't just a little, you know, because it says that he, he spilled on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. And he spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Now, you know how much saliva it's going to take to make a mud, okay? This wasn't just a little, you know, little, little spat, you know? He had, he had to clear his throat a few times. Let's just say that, okay? And then he, he makes the, the mud and he puts it on his eyes. You know, mud was used as a very common uh, cream back in those days. They didn't have medical cream. And so what they believed was they would take mud and they would put mud on, on certain things that were sore or certain things that were, that were needing healing. And they believed that mud had the power to, to, to heal. Can you believe that? You know, now we're like, oh, get infected, you know. But they actually believed in the healing power of mud. And so they would put mud and allow some of the, the, the uh, natural things that are in the earth that bring some healing, okay? And so it was a very common thing for people to use mud on, when someone had something wrong. And so the reason why I'm saying that to say this, that this really wasn't that far of a stretch that Jesus would put mud on somebody, okay? Because they used mud a lot for medical reasons. But I want you to think about this man was there, and I believe this man was there listening and hearing what was going on. You see, sometimes we miss our miracle because we are looking for something big and dramatic when God's trying to work through something ordinary. Oftentimes we're waiting around for something big and dramatic to happen when God's trying to work through something ordinary. This man was blind, which means that we know that when people lose one of their main senses, that the other senses begin to heighten, get more sensitive. So it's my belief that this man, because he was blind, learned to hear really, really well. This is how he traveled and navigated around. It's how he could tell who was around him, how he could hear what, where he was at, learned to move from location to location based off of sounds. And so... Can you imagine him hearing the sounds that Jesus is on his way? The crowd begins to whisper, shout, Jesus is heading this way. Hey, Jesus and disciples are going to cross this way. They're going to be near to here. And he remembers the stories that he's heard already of Jesus healing the blind or Jesus healing the sick. And in his mind, he's got to be thinking, could this be my day? Could this be my day of healing? And as he gets closer, he can hear Jesus and his disciples talking about him. Who was it that made the mistake that this man had this happen to him? And Jesus is correcting them. Can you imagine this man hearing this story unfold right in front of him? And then he's waiting for the miraculous, for Jesus to walk up and say, Man, stand up, open your eyes to the heavens. I am giving you sight back. I mean, he's waiting for this big miraculous thing to happen. And instead, all he hears is, <clears throat> <laughs> Is 
and he hears Jesus spit on the ground, rolling some mud and slapping it in his eyes. I mean, think about it. how many people would, first of all, either be offended that he put that saliva in my eyes today, we would be, right? <laughs> yeah, so we ain't touching, okay? Don't get that saliva on me. But how many people would be offended if Jesus spit and made mud and put it in their eyes? And this man, we don't see any ounce where he was offended at all. But it really makes no sense to you and I to think, what good does mud do? What good does the dirt do? What good does the saliva do? What good is it really for? You know, several years ago, I visited the country of Brazil, was on a missions trip there. And as I was there, we were ministering in the Manaus area, and then we began to minister in villages going down the Amazon, and we got on a big two-story boat and spent several days going up and down the Amazon ministering to remote villages. And before we got on the river, one of the last towns we were at, I was preaching one night there, and I had these group of delegate of officials that were with us, the ministers, and they said, we want you to minister at one of our churches that just started here. Uh, this guy, he's, he's kind of... He's kind of exciting, and he's all for it, but, you know, we want you to come minister for him. So I get there, and this guy comes up about right here on me. It's no lie. Very short man, very young man. And while he's there, he had this sign banner painted about how many people he wanted to see. It was like thousands of people, you know, wanted to see his church to grow to. And, and uh, he had his whole church would fit probably about half of our platform here. So it was a really, really tiny church. We had more people show up with us that were actually there in the church. And so, and they were like, I could tell when he was talking that the, some of the uh, governing officials were kind of like, kind of halfway rolling their eyes, like, you know, this guy just runs his mouth. You know, he's, he's got these big dreams and vision, but he's only got like, you know, 10 people coming to his church. You know, and I remember I got up that night and I, I preached my little heart out and uh, was ministering at the end, praying for everybody. And I had translators that were, were helping me speak from Portuguese into English. And so I, I called this pastor up and I began to have him translate and I began to pray over him. And as I was praying for him, I just, the spirit of God gripped my, my words. You never have, you know when that happens. And I said, man, I want you to know that I believe that God's going to put the spirit of David upon you. I said, you are a mighty man of God. I said, don't you let anybody tell you anything differently. I said, God's anointing is upon you, and you're highly favored of the Lord, and you go after every dream he's put in your heart. And as I was praying for him, I felt, you know, sometimes it's hard to translate your love for somebody, you know, and you're, you're trying to just uh, let them know that you love them, and you, you know, that I'm no better than you are, and you just want them to feel, you know, love. And so I remembered when Jesus took time to wash his disciples' feet, and so while I was there, when, when I'm preaching like in a place like Brazil, there's no air conditioner and you just soak, you know, you soak your clothes with sweat because it's just hot. There's no AC in a lot of those places, especially when you get down into some smaller villages. And so I had a uh, black T-shirt on under, underneath my dress shirt. And so I just felt led of the Lord. I took off my dress shirt. I reached down on my hands and knees and I just cleaned the shoes with my dress shirt. That's all I did. Prayed for him. Several years later, I went back about, I think it was about seven years later, I went back, and they go, Pastor, we, we got to take you back to that church. You, you're not going to believe this. They go, we're not going to tell you anything else, but you're not going to believe this. And we got back there, and this little bitty church had grown to take over a whole big city block. And he had constructed this big church auditorium that they had built by hand and out of brick. And he had the pace packed with thousands of people. And he was there, and he had his Bible, and he was waiting. When I walked in that night to preach to his congregation, he was there, and he was fell to his knees, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried. And he got up finally, and he, I said, what's wrong? And he couldn't get the words to tell me. Finally, he got up, he says, sir, pastor, you don't know that your words, you were the first one to ever say you believed in me. Everybody else laughed at me. Everybody else thought I was crazy. But you looked at me that day. You prayed over me. And when you washed my feet and you spoke those words over to me, he goes, something broke in my heart. He goes, and I believe that God used to everything you said. Now, what I said and what I did, I used a shirt that was soaking wet with my sweat. I used words that I would pray. Just, I didn't pray anything miraculous. I just spoke what God put on my heart. But when God infused what I had to say, when God used a shirt, 
It did something miraculous in somebody's life. And what I'm here to tell you is sometimes we don't think of the ordinary things that we have can be used in a miraculous way. But when God takes something natural and puts his super into it, it becomes supernatural. On the same trip, there was a young man. I remember one night when I got back off the boat, they took me down, and I was preaching at the two largest churches there. So they, they had me preaching like at 5 o'clock at one church. There was like 1,500 people there, and then I went back. And as soon as I got done, they put me in a car and zipped me across town. They'd been waiting on me the whole time, and I walk in. They'd just been praising worship, and they put me right on stage, and I preached to another thousands of people there. And I was like, what? This is like back to back. And so, man, it was a great night of ministry. Prayed for a lot of people. And when I got done, I had so Soaked that shirt out again, of course, you know, I had a different shirt. I had soaked it out, and there was a young man who was traveling with me there, and I was, by that time, I was learning that I wanted to give my stuff away. I didn't want to leave there without giving everything I had away, so I tried to give something away everywhere I went, and so I, I had preached that shirt. It was full of sweat, and I took it off, and I gave it to a youth pastor that was there that was on our trip with us, and his name, some of you guys know him. His name was Aldi, Aldi. Remember Hillary and all day you do come and the missionaries who pray and have good hearing. And, and uh, Hillary told me later, she said, when you gave him that shirt, he went home and he slept with that shirt for two weeks. And he hung on to it and he prayed that God would give him the same kind of anointing that you preached with, that he could preach with that same anointing. And he went from there to, of course, we know they've, they've started the missionary school. They've started the home church. They've started churches up and down the Amazon region. They've started churches in Peru. They've raised up missionaries. They've raised up pastors. They've raised up worship leaders. And, man, they're just doing these awesome things for God. And I'm not saying all because of that, but I want you to know that had an impact. Something as simple as me giving somebody my shirt had an impact. Something as simple as a one day's wage doesn't seem like it adds up a lot, but when we all come together, we can give $20,000 to feed 150 kids. It makes an impact. It's an ordinary thing. It's an ordinary day's wage, but it becomes unordinary when we bring it together and God breathes upon it and it does something miraculous. I'm telling you, it's the ordinary that God wants to move through. we got to quit waiting for the miraculous dramatic to happen and open our eyes that every day God's wanting to use everyday people, everyday words, everyday prayers to make a miraculous difference in people's lives. God uses saliva and mud. God uses saliva and mud. How does that make a difference? Number two, it makes a difference because God infuses his power. See, that's how it makes a difference when we take the ordinary things. They don't seem like they matter, but God infuses his power. They become supernatural. See, when something is out of our control, we must let God take control. We surrender control to God of our ordinary, everyday life. If someone's life is changed because of what I preach today or any other sermon, it's not because of anything other than God took my words, he infused his power, and it changed somebody's life. It's because the power of God is infusing that. He's taking that. He's using that. And he wants to do the same in your life. It's not just because I'm the pastor. I guarantee you, if you begin to speak and see ordinary people and see their mess and begin just to speak a word of encouragement to their mess, I promise you, God will infuse that and use your words. I don't know if I can pray for that person. I'll tell you, you just take someone's hand and pray for them. Crazy it may be, it may be in the middle of Walmart. I know it sounds crazy. Jeff, I've seen God do miraculous things in Walmart. How about you? Jesus seen miraculous people healed in the middle of Walmart just because he took time and said, hey, man, God, let me pray for you. Sure. Boom. People being healed. I'm telling you, it happens. See, God used dirt and saliva represents, you know, water from my body. It doesn't seem like it's something that would be that great of a thing. I mean, we know dirt. We see dirt every day. Matter of fact, the Bible says that we all came from dirt. It says from the dirt, the dust of the ground that God grabbed and he breathed life into us. So if you ever hear someone say, man, that person's dirt, you look at them and say, we were all dirt at one time. All right, just saying. It wasn't for the grace of God, right? We've all sinned and come short of God's glory. Our lives many times looks dirty, looks messy. 
It represents our life. Dirt represents our life. And water, we see in Scripture that water represents God's presence. It represents the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus that came walking upon the water. It was the children of Israel who had to walk through the part of water to get to the promised land. It's the water that we are baptized. We see the prophet said, I hear a heavenly rain coming. We see water throughout scripture used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit and God's presence. But water, we, we drink it every day, right? We can, we can spit it out of our mouth if we need to. It, it's, it's a symbol of many things in our life. These are just ordinary things, right? I don't look at this and see a miracle. Do you look at this and see a miracle? No, I see dirt and I see water. But the great news is this, when we take our life, because dirt represents our life, and we take the water, and the water of God's presence, the water of God's life in our life, and we pour it into our life, something happens, something begins to change. You know what happens? All of a sudden, we got mud. We got mud. How many of you had to step into mud or cross mud to get here today? It was raining outside. Several of you, right? You didn't look across that mud and go, oh, thank you, Lord, for that mud. No, you're like, you better not get that mud in my car. I'm telling you right now. Been cleaning that car all week. It was nice weather. But you get that mud in my house. We, we don't look at it, and we just see Water, saliva, and we see dirt, and then we see mud, and we don't see much of anything. We don't see any value. Why would God take water and dirt and then make mud and put it in his eyes? Because we got to understand something. God's ways are not our ways. God sees through our mess, and that when God takes dirt and he takes the water of his presence and puts it on there, something beautiful can come out of that. Something can change out of that. And out of dirt and out of water, God can bring forth something beautiful. And this is the same way in our lives. That sometimes we see the dirt of our life. We see the junk in our life and, and God says, I want to pour onto it. And at first it just looks like mud. It doesn't look like anything special. But I'm telling you, how many times do we drive by every single day and we see beautiful spring flowers? We see Big trees blossoming with their new leaves coming in the spring. And we see all this happening and realize that all started with some water and some dirt. That God grew something miraculously beautiful out of that. Every day God's been trying to tell you something. Every day he's been trying to tell me something. That through the ordinary things every day he's wanting to be encouraged of a miracle. That he can spit into the dirt if he wants to. And he can put it into a man's eyes and he can see again. Why? Because that's the power of what God does. God brings something beautiful out of our mess. I'm going to invite our musicians to come as I give you our last point here. And it's number three. God invites you and I to participate. He invites you to participate in the miracle. Look what verse 7 says right here. He told this man, go wash yourself. This is important. Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went and he washed and he came back seeing. Now it's important because this man had a part to play, didn't he? He had to do, he had to be obedient. And I believe, we, if we study this out, that this man had the mud in his eyes, and Jesus said, go wash yourself in Siloam. Now, we know this to be true, that we can look at the map and see that this man had plenty of places to stop and wash his eyes out without going all the way to Siloam. But I believe 100% that the miracle wouldn't have happened unless this man fully did what Jesus had told him to do. And it's because he used the faith. He went. And he washed where Jesus told him to wash. This man washed his eyes, and it says he came back seen. See, he had a part to play. He had a part to act in faith. He had to do his part as well. And so today, my prayer is this, is that you would take through this message, that you would see that God wants to do something miraculous in our lives. God wants to do something miraculous, and oftentimes, it's in the ordinary things in our life. Every time we see a mess, it's somewhere for God to operate. Whether it be my life or it be somebody else's life, God is wanting to do something special through the mess. 
He wants to pour his water into the dirt. He wants someone to see again. He wants someone to believe again. He wants someone to, to dream again. He wants somebody to love again. He wants somebody to understand the value of their life again. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads. As you do, I'm going to ask you the question today. And the question is simply this. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Have you ever given your life in a full surrender to Jesus Christ? The Bible says that to be a believer, we must first of all believe, right? We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then it says we must also confess it with our mouth. We believe in our heart and we confess it with our mouth. If you're here today and you're ready to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you say, Pastor, I need, I need him. I'm ready today to surrender my life to him. We won't do anything to single you out. We're not going to call you up or embarrass you, I promise you. But without anybody looking, if that's you today, where you're sitting, you say, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. Can you just lift your hand for me to see so I can see it? Thank you. Anybody else? You're ready to join them. Thank you. Anybody else ready to join them? This is a beautiful day. Come on now. If this is your day, don't miss it. Raise your hand. I thank you guys. I see those hands going up back there. Yeah. The Spirit of God is calling people today. And we're just going to make sure. If you didn't raise your hand, raise it right now. I want to make sure you had a chance. Yeah, I see you. Thank you. Yes. If you raise your hand, I want you to say this prayer after me. As Christians sitting around you, we'll help you as well. Say it out loud. Let's say, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins. I surrender all of my life to you. I believe you are the Messiah, God's only son. Thank you for dying on the cross for my life and my sins. And from this day forward, I will live for you and I will follow you all the days of my life in Jesus name we say amen if you prayed that prayer for the first time come on put your hands together let's welcome to the family of the Lord now listen if you prayed that prayer it's it's just the beginning it's just a beginning step okay there's more to it you need to get plugged into a church home okay you gotta you gotta come and learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus Learn what it means to be following Jesus. It's just the beginning point, okay? Now my life now, says God, I'm going to follow you and learn the rest of my life what that means.